everyone. This is your girl, Rosita Cooper, and my special guest for today is Jean Anderson, the Hall of Famer on Living Your Dreams with Rosita. How you doing today? I'm trying to do the best I can, and hopefully I do it good enough to stay on your show long enough to finish this wonderful interview. <laughs> Thank you. I really appreciate you being on the show. This is so awesome. This is my first time ever being on Zoom, so I'm, I'm kind of new to this. Oh, yeah. But I'm true to this, but I'm kind of new to this. That's all right. You got this now. Yeah. You, got it. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? They say I'm just like Nightcrawler. I'm hard to catch. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't do very many interviews. I, I kind of duck some. I let somebody else do them for me. Well, I'm glad I caught you. I, I am honored. You hear me? I really appreciate you right now. Well, you know, I, I heard that smiling voice. <laughs> I had to go with it. <laughs> it's, it's funny that people be saying they can hear me smile, well, see me smiling through the phone and stuff even before. Yeah, that, you got the most smiling this voice I ever, I just, come on with it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I appreciate it. I really thank you so much. And so, you better put this in the Hall of Fame and claim it because I don't do many interviews. Oh, yeah. I turned down CNN. <laughs> oh, yeah. CNN. Yes, I did. I'm living your dreams, Rosita. He turned down yeah. CNN. I, I, I turned down uh, 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 Video One. I turned them down. I turned down BT once because I don't really do very many interviews. I let somebody else do them. Wow. Well, I appreciate you. And, and y'all, his book right here. Uh oh. Yes, yes, that's yes. me. He is an author, an author yeah, the of birth of hip hop. Yeah, the Gene Anderson story, the rapper's delight. Yes, I read this book and I was like, oh my god, you know, you well, you know, that book that was an accident. You said that dared me to write this book. <laughs> <laughs> you hear me? You set the tone. Do you you have done some amazing, amazing things, you know, and I want to say I appreciate you for everything that you started, everything that you had your hand in that was started, and congratulations on everything, you know, and I'm proud of you. I want to say that. I am so proud of you. Well, you know, when when those experiences was actually happening at the time, I had no thought of what it really turned out to be in the final analysis. It was just a case of staying alive, doing something else, and staying show business. When this didn't work, I tried that. When that yeah. didn't work, I tried this. And in the final analysis, it came out the birth of hip hop. Exactly. But but you know, it, what we think is not working, God is really trying to guide us somewhere else. And I see from reading this book, everywhere you was guided, you made a difference. Well, you know what? I, I'm very spiritual, and I know God had a plan. Yeah. And he saved me through so many perils of life and so many different opportunities that I blew and still survived it, that I just had to just keep on going. And, and, and one thing led to another. Before I knew it, it became, the news became history. Mm. And then someone, or several someones, just press me hard and say, Gene, knowing who you are, what you've done, you need to document it. Yeah. So I finally came around to the point of documenting the book. Yeah. I just told a factual story chronologically as I could keep it in my mind and okay. present it and document it and put it down. Exactly. And, and I see on the back of it, I see on the back it said every word in this book is the truth, the whole truth. Well, and and nothing <laughs> but the truth. <laughs> yeah, well, you know what? You got one thing about the truth. If you tell the truth, you don't have to remember what you're saying. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? Cause, and you be yourself, you don't have to remember how you were last time. Exactly. And you can have all you want, but don't take no more than you can stand. Cause you got the thing that's called, James Brown says, the big payback. <laughs> you got the payback. <laughs> exactly. Don't take no more than you can stand the payback. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I see that you came from Memphis, Tennessee, and then moved up north. Yeah, no, 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 no. I, the story starts after I got divorced from my first wife. Okay. I had a son. Mm -hmm. And 
when we got divorced, I got custody of him. He was five. Uh -huh. Yeah, I was uh, a floating star. I'd had several hit records over there with Willie Mitchell and Al Green now. Uh -huh. And I had a couple of big, big, big records that I had written, produced as well as I had cut myself. And all that stuff was floating. I had to put everything on hiatus because now that I divorced my wife, I got this kid and it's me and him. I got no job, I got no nothing. My job is singing and entertaining, but I got a five-year-old baby. What am I gonna do with this kid? I can't eat him, I gotta love him, I gotta love him, take care of him. I got him down there. Willie Mitchell made me send for him. My mom and them, grandma and them send him home to me. I got this kid and I'm trying to raise him. Uh -huh. So my career wasn't going too good down there. And I had an incident where when Elvis Presley died, me and my son had a little old raggedy car. We had a little a Pontiac, a white Catalina Pontiac. And we was, I went to see about a gig that, that I had to get my money so uh -huh. I could get him some shoes, school from the Starbucks, so I get him some shoes and stuff, right? And leaving from the club, they was having Elvis Presley's funeral. Uh -huh. And my car was the last car on the street because they was clean the street so they could go to the cemetery. The wheel come off of my car in the middle of the street and stop Elvis Presley's dead ass in the middle of the street. And it was a, almost a riot. They was trying to kill me because he I didn't stop with a raggedy ass car, me and his kid, and the car didn't stop in the middle of the street and Elvis Presley is dead and everybody crying. And all of a sudden this black dude got this car stuck up like that. The boys, Three or four, about seven, eight of them big white boys grabbed the car and picked it up and put it on the sidewalk. My kid says to me, said, Daddy, Daddy, they're taking our car. I said, shut up and let them have it. <laughs> <laughs> they takes the car, put the car on the sidewalk. Then they takes Elvis Presley and buries him. After that, I was through with Memphis. I said, man, we got to go. We got to go. I, we got to go, go back home. So we go back home to St. Louis. When we go back home to St. Louis, I quit the record company and everything else. I went down there to some old guys I knew had a section in St. Louis, what they call Record Row, which records started a lot of big things in record business back in the old, old days, like the 78 days and the early 45 days. Started there, I knew some of the old Jewish guys. Uh -huh. So I went down there to hang out with them in order to see if I could get something going with me and for this kid. I don't know nothing else, but entertainment, I've been singing since I was three. I don't know nothing else. Exactly. And I got this kid, I'm loving him. He ain't nothing but five. I'm saying, oh my God, what am I going to do with this here, baby? You know? <laughs> so I moved in with my mom and I went down there with those guys. And they were so glad to see me. Some of the old guys knew me as a youngster growing up trying to get in show business and cutting little renegade records and stuff before I did. The, the real thing with the high records. Put me in the rings and put me in the back room where they was playing gin rummy all the time. And all of the old Jewish guys that started the business, that it was out of the business, that made their money and stole everybody's money and took off in the back playing gin rummy. That some of them see me and knew me, they embraced me. And I was their boy. I hung out with them a couple, three days. And they finally came up, an old man named Harold Goldman. Never will forget him. He was a smart old man. And he took to me just like a duck of water. And he asked me, son, what would you like to do? I said, I'd like to have a distributing company put my records and stuff together and try to promote some records and get something going. He said, come talk to me next week. Next week, I go down there. And this other guy that I had known a long time, named Skip Gorman, he and Harold was tight. Skip needed a Gene Anderson and I needed a Skip. Uh -huh. So Mr. Goldman had the money. Mr. Goldman bought us an office next door to the place where they hung out at, which was Pat Blunder's One Stop Record One. They were working one stop then. And we started an independent record distributor and I got my first office down there with these guys. Uh -huh. This is how it all really started. So we was getting records. Skip knew a few people, he called a few people, they sent him a record in and somebody else sent him a record in and we start to uh, 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 putting the records in, in record stores and stuff and we started to putting them in, to take them to the radio station and take them to the club. We started something called a disco pool. We started to 
you know, pass them out and people start to hear them and they start to want to buy them, they buy them from us. And we sell them to the one stops and the one stops up to the pop and mama pop shops and people start buying them. So all my records that they was giving me to promote was hidden. So my name is traveling all around the country that if you want to hit record in St. Louis, you got to go down to Middle West Record Distributors and see Poo Poo Man Gene Allison. Exactly. So one day I get a telephone call, make a long story short, I get a telephone call from a guy by the name of Joe Robinson. And Joe Robinson was the owner of a record company at that time was called All Platinum. And All Platinum happened to be uh, in litigation with a group called The Moments, which end up Ray Goodman and Brown. Yeah. So the court had put an injunction on the company and the group. The group couldn't go out as The Moments no more, and the company couldn't go out no more as All Platinum. Joe calls and asks Skippy, he said, man, I got a new company called Turbo, and we got a record on a group called Trouble Funk. It was Go-Go record. Those boys, uh, Max Kidd had had them early on because I knew who they were. And he said, man, well, we ain't got nobody to promote this stuff. Talk to Gene. I talked to him. He sent the record in there. We took the record out. The record made a, yeah, a little bit of Pee Wee noise. He said another one on him said, yeah, Pee Wee noise. Then one day he called me and said, Gene, we got something new that we don't know what to do with it. Won't nobody touch it. And we took the acetate around to different disc jockers and they said they wasn't gonna play it for one reason. They said the record is too long. Oh. The record was 15 minutes long. <laughs> and they took it to a guy named Frankie Crocker in New York. Frankie Crocker said, man, I have been playing this kind of crap. I don't know about this kind of stuff. Because nobody had never heard nothing like that. He, I said, what is it? He said, I don't know what is it. <laughs> he said, we called it rap music. We don't know if, what it is, but that's what they're doing. I said, well, what's rapping? I don't even know what the word is. I never heard it before in life. So they said, he said, I'm gonna send it to you overnight. He said it overnight, next day, I get the record. I push the, the it's an acetate, it weighs about a ton. It's a steel plate with plastic on, with, 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 with vinyl on it, and you play it, 10 plays, it was dead. Mm -hmm. He sent me the acetate, and I played it. And it turned out, I said, wait a minute, this record sound like Sheets Good Time. <laughs> and then they started rapping. Boom, boom, boom. But boom, 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 boom. So they hip hop. I said, what? I'm thinking it was the boys in East St. Louis because we on the radio, rapping on the radio. We've been rapping on the radio two, three years. We don't know what it is. We just talking smack on the radio, right? Yeah. I'm thinking they just sneaked off New York and cut a record and left me. I'm mad. I'm upset. Like, man, you. You guys have kept this record. I ain't out here. I ain't on the record, man. And y'all, you know, I'm the one that started this shit on the radio and everything. He said, man, we ain't cut no record. I'm going to play it again. The next day, I looks in the mail. He sends me about five copies on vinyl, wrote with red pencil writing on a white label. No label, handwritten, says, Rapper's Delight. I said, damn. Let me take it to the radio station and see what's happening. I took it to the radio station. I took it over to WSL because the other stations wasn't, they weren't even talking to me too much because they weren't too happy about my attitude. I always had an attitude that if you don't, somebody else will. I'm going to do it anyway because I'm not, I'm not, I ain't geared to do a dot. I'm geared to do wit. You know what I'm saying? Plus, I got this kid five years old that I got to take care of. He, you know what I'm saying? I got to feed him. Exactly. I got to do something. You're going to make it happen by any means necessary. By any means necessary. Exactly. <laughs> so, right. so I took the record and got in my mama's car, go straight up, because we done left our car in Memphis, because we done lost the wheel and everything else. The police trying to lock us up. The white boys are trying to hang us. The Ku Klux Klan trying to hang us. And Elvis Presley's ghost is trying to get us from stopping his funeral. So I'm out of there. <laughs> so I go to the radio station and Gates, I go to see Jim Gates and WESL, Jim Gates said, hey man, a dude, an old man named Dave Clark brought me the record, bought a record for me from Joe in a package I ain't never opened it before. I said, well, this is the same record. 
he said, well, come on to the studio. He put it on that studio and he played it. He said, man, this is a smash. He said, but it's too long. Uh -huh. I said, I don't care about being too long. I ain't got nothing else. This kid got to eat. Somebody got to play these records, man. <laughs> so he played it. And soon he played it. The telephone lit up. Boom, all hell broke loose. So he, he, he said, we ain't playing number this record all day. Wow. They must have played it 35 times that day. Wow. Every time they played, more phone calls started coming in. More phone calls. Next thing you know, the parking lot was full of kids. Because you could hear the radio outside the building. Yeah. The parking lot was full of kids. They dancing in the parking lot to the rappers delight. The, the wow. first day, they out there dancing to the rappers delight. Everybody want to know what it is. I don't know what it is. Joe called by and said, what they think about the record? I said, man, the record's unbelievable. I don't know what's going on with it. He said, listen, send me some money, man, so I can press the first thousand of them. I said, I ain't got nothing but a couple hundred dollars, Joe. Skip them ain't hardly got no money. We just dangling and hanging on, just getting started. We hustle up about $1,500 or so and send it to Joe overnight. Joe sent us our first thousand records. Then they came back. It wasn't a white label. It was a red label. Wrote in pencil. Says... The sugar, they didn't have a name for the group. <laughs> Say, the Sugar Hill Gang, the rapper's delight. Mm. I took those records and, 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 and took them to the clubs. I took them to the other radio stations. I took them to, to, the, to, to the, the mom and pop shops all over the, my area. Called up a bunch of DJs I knew out of town in Kansas City and Memphis, Tennessee and all that. And I sent them a copy of Overnight Mail, right? Before you know it, about less than a week, we, the front door came even closed, be inside, outside, inside, outside the door, trying to get a copy of this record. All the DJs in the streets want a copy. The record is just phenomenal. It's going crazy. People calling me, man, everybody want to talk to Gene Anderson, Poopoo Man, now, nah, because he don't want somebody in the world know about with this record. Yeah. Because that's going to show the power of a real, real, real hit record. Yeah. We call it Rapper's Delight. They said, what's the rappers like? I, I don't know what it is. All I know is I got a bunch of them and I'm selling them, coming by. Well, you know, people start to coming in and buying boxes. Wow. 12 and 9 and 12 of them, people, just regular people on the streets was buying them and selling them out the trunk of their cars. We were selling for $2.50 a record and they were selling for $5. Wow. So they were making 50% profit. And so we were selling and we were selling them so fast we couldn't get enough of them. So we asked Joe to send us another five thousand. Joe sends another five thousand records. Now we got records stacked up in the ceiling all over the place. Nothing but the rappers tonight. We don't forgot about all of the other records in the place. <laughs> so I get the records and start shipping and sending, them, shipping and sending them everywhere all over the country that I knew, people that I knew. And everybody was calling me back, man, we need some more, we need some more. I went down to Memphis, down to Boss Ugly Bob's. That's his record distributor. My brother had a little distributor called Boss Ugly. He fooled around and made so much money, he didn't sell nothing else but that. He didn't care nothing about nothing else but that. The record was such a phenomenon. Now, everybody in the country is trying to call me because I'm the dude that got it started. And they knew that because everybody thought the record was not going to make it. Because at one point, it was 15 minutes long. It was too yeah. long. Yeah. So I had Joe to cut the record in half so I could put it on the jukeboxes and make a 45 out of it. So one half was seven minutes, level seven minutes on the front <laughs> side and the back side. But 45. Now I got a jukebox record. Nice. So I'm running like a dog with that record. Before you know it, Everybody in the United States is calling me, want me to work that record. Then okay. Joe called me again and said, man, I got another record. It's by a group called Sequence. The record's called Gonna Funk You Right On Up. I said, well, send it to me. He sent it to me. I broke it the same way. Then he come with, he said, I got another group called Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five. Oh. The record called, I think it was Freedom. He said, send, I said, send that. I broke that record. Then he brought me some more stuff. Next thing I know, other record companies start to call me. And then next thing I knew, I heard from a, a, a big record company, I think it was a Brunswick, sent me a record called Skate Bounce Rock Roll by Von Mason and Crew. Oh. You know, all oh, skate, all oh, rock. Yeah. 
Oh. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, so I breaks that record. Next thing I know, I get another record, three or four or five records down the track. I get a record called A Message. It's like a jungle sometimes. It makes you wonder what you keep from going under. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> I, I take that record. I bust that record. It's a whole story about that in the book. Wow. I broke that record. I broke Planet Rock. I broke Curtis Blow, Christmas Rap, Basketball. I broke a, 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 a Atomic Dog, George Clinton. I broke yeah. that record. Before you know it, all the big hit records that was of that era, they were sent to me first because it was a test to find out what the records do any good. Wow. You know, so it just grew and it grew and it grew. And there were so many episodes in between each record that happened. And certain people that you got affiliated with that really didn't belong in the record business that Really, the record business was just too dynamic for them, and they had they had to really get they got problems in their lifestyle because it was too fast of a lane for those that really was rookies about entertainment that wanted to be a part of that. Uh -huh. So I had a for no, I got a whole street team. I created a street team because they had no such animal. Then I got a bunch of youngsters that was cool with me that that had nerve to go in them clubs. And the records was getting in them clubs free. If you got some records for the DJ, you can get in the club free. You ain't got to pay that $5, $2.50, $7, $12 to get in. You just say, man, I got a brand new record. Poo-poo, send me with a new record. That's all that's. Now I got 15, 20 people working for me going to the stores, <laughs> going to the clubs every night. And my records are selling like a dog. So, you know, it goes on and on and on and on. But all of that in this, in this real chronological order is in the book. Yeah. The book yeah, it, it explained a whole lot of things that in between records there was individuals and circumstances. Matter of a fact, as I look back at it, I'm amazed. Personally, I'm amazed how if I used to take a record to a radio station and the guys would tell me, man, we're not gonna play this record because we played the last one. That was the last rap record we're gonna ever play. I said, man, you got to play the record. He said, why? <laughs> I said, cause I gotta feed this kid. I ain't got nothing else but these rap records. <laughs> He's all I got. The woman to run off. <laughs> I got the baby. <laughs> I like the story on how uh, you basically got them to start a distribution company. You know, when they was asking you- Oh yeah, I, 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 I talked to that. Yeah. Yeah, I talked him into that one. Mr. Goldman did that though. Mr. Goldman yeah. taught me a lot of things. He was smart. He was a smart old man. He was he oh. matter of fact, he didn't have one prejudice bone in his body. Oh. He he appreciated nerve, talent, and ambition. He appreciated that, those qualities in anybody. And man, it was really tight. Until the old man died. I loved him to the last day. He was Mr. Goldman. He was he was a true person. Now Skip was slick. Skip <laughs> was, the, was, was like, yeah. Me and Skip didn't really get along like uh, Skip was very jealous because uh -huh. he didn't think I was going to be able to do what I end up doing he, at all. And uh -huh. like, well, you know, it goes like that. Uh huh. Well, you know, in this industry and stuff, it's always going to be somebody jealous and stuff. So yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I had a great time, but you know what? But, but as I now, I get close to Joe. Joe yeah. showed me things. Joe showed me things that I never would have known in life. But one thing, uh, Joe was a genius, oh. but Joe was a gangster. Oh. Joe was real. He was with the real mob. He's a big number player in New York City long before we came into the record business. And and Joe was was tight with some of the big, big, big boys in my New York. And Joe was tough. And I was Joe's boy. Yeah. And if, if, if I liked it and I wanted it, Joe made sure I could have it in spades. Uh -huh. If I needed it to get the job done, Joe would do that. And they, no, they couldn't just do me any kind of way because they had to answer to Joe. Uh -huh. And so I'm young, fresh out of Vietnam. I got a kid. I'm a star, and I'm still trying to survive and get my game together. And I got a gangster like Joe Robinson behind me. I'm going to do everything I want to do. I ain't doing what I, 
what I want, I can, I'm doing what I want to. Yeah. I'm young and I'm yeah. young and full of full of mess. So you know good well. I'm doing some impossible shit. <laughs> I know I know you said that Miss Sylvia, Joe, but that Joe White, that anytime that Joe was yeah, Sylvia Robinson. Yeah, 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 yeah. Me, <laughs> huh? Well, you know who Sylvia was, don't you? Who she was? Sylvia was was do you remember that group called Mickey and Sylvia had a, a original hit records called Love is Strange? No, I Love is strange, yeah, the people. That was, a, and yeah. Peaches and Herb covered it. Yeah. The original record was Mickey and Sylvia. That's who Sylvia was. Nice. Joe nice. stole Sylvia from Mickey and them, and them gangsters, and married her, and had five, four babies. <laughs> <laughs> So she loved me to get. So when Joe wouldn't act right, I call her up and threaten her every time I got a chance. Joe, now you don't want me to tell me to me on you now. I'm telling you, I, I need a couple thousand dollars. This kid got to eat. I need some money. Now, Joe, I ain't playing. I'm broke, man. <laughs> well, poop, I just sent you some money. I don't care. Miss Sylvia, Joe, is, Joe ain't giving me nothing. <laughs> she said, Joe Robinson, you can't do poo poo like that. <laughs> oh, she loved her, Gene Anderson. That was my baby boy. She, just, she the first woman I know had a Rolls Royce and didn't like it. What? <laughs> a straight brand new Silver Cloud Rolls Royce and couldn't stand it. Wow. <laughs> she wanted another one. She was fantastic. She was a fantastic person. Oh, and she, wow. to the last day she died, me and her was extremely tight. We was really tight. Matter of fact, ironically, the whole family died except one person. That's mm -hmm. Leland. He's in the book, too. Remember, he took me around town with mm -hmm. the back, and ain't going to protect me. Yeah. 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 <laughs> he's going to protect me. Yeah, Leland. Yeah, he, he's something else. <laughs> he's still, he owns the company. He owns everything now. Oh, nice, nice. Everybody else died. Joey died. Uh, 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 Spoonie died. Joe Robson died. Oh. Miss Rob, she died. Big Bang Hank, he died. Oh. There's a whole bunch of them. Everybody gone. All of the, all of the old, old promo guys, the original old, old school guys, all them dead. Red Forbes and them, Mad Hatter and them, all them guys, they gone. They, they been oh. gone. I'm the last, I'm the first one that they had, and I'm the last man standing. I think Spider's alive, maybe Gus Redmond and a couple, three other guys, but they came in after me. I was the yeah. original, absolute first guy to see the record, see the whole genre of hip hop music, touch it in my hand, and took it to the, took it to the street. First one, first nice, one. Nice, nice. That's, that's what the book is called, The Birth of Hip Hop. Look, I also like the story when uh, you were saying that uh, Joe, he took the music to Russia. He sent the music to Russia to, you know. Oh, to Moscow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. See, what happened was, that's when I introduced Joe to to a, a, a Al Bell, who was the president of Stax Record. Yeah, Al Bell, he yeah. owned Stax Record. And Al Bell, had, they, they, took, they took Stax Records from them guys. Oh. Uh, the, the gangsters down at Memphis had oh. took Stax Vote Records away through Union Planners Bank. Oh. Al got no job. Fallen priest, a, 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 a fallen chief. But man, it was tight. He goes to a convention, he wants to get back in the game, but he ain't got no juice no more. Yeah. Ain't nothing worse than a person that's been big, that lose their power, and people that can grow up around them, they want to kick you sand in his face right now if they can. Uh -huh. So Joe was having a meeting with, with with people from Solar, Dick Griffin and them, and, and uh, 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 Max Kidd and them, and Lonnie Simmons of uh, Total Experience, all them different guys, they was having a big meeting at a convention. And so I got to lose notoriety because I'm the guy that invented the hip hop uh, uh, method of promotions and brought the records to the forefront so people know who I am now. Exactly. This time is going on with the, with, the, with the success in the different types of kids, right? And 
And I said, man, I sure want to meet Joe Robinson. I said, well, Al, I said, I can fix it so you can meet Joe. Cause me and Al Bell is tight now, and we've been tight all of my whole career. Mm. He was flying high over the stacks when he had Johnny Taylor and the Staples Singers and, and the Barcades and Otis Redden and J all those kind of guys, Luther Ingram, he had all that. That was Al Bell stuff. Nice. So we was all tight from back during them days. And he my friend to now. And like, I couldn't, I couldn't stomach seeing him at the bottom of the pile when I known him as being a super giant. And that was a favor that I could do for him uh -huh. with just only a word to a person that I had helped reestablish his lifestyle That's as a part of it. And so I went into the meeting. Joe was on the panel uh -huh. to get Joe to come out from the panel in the meeting to meet Al Bell because he only had a little time. And so Joe was in the middle of a conference and the conference went like, he was explaining, everybody was hollering. It was people from, I think it was uh, uh, Polydor Records was trying to sign up all of the independent record labels to do a worldwide distribution deal. Oh. And all of them thought it was a big opportunity and a big break. But Joe, Joe thought it was a sucker deal. Oh. And they said, well, man, we getting worldwide distribution on every record. We getting a certain amount of money in the front. And, and how is that a bad deal? Joe said, Joe was so smart. Joe says to them, he said, listen, each country that they gave you on allegedly a, uh, a worldwide distribution is supposed to pay you independently. Oh. Instead of you got just one big check for the whole wide world that this one company gonna give you, they owe you about 50 checks. And you crying about, you bragging about one check, you just fell for a sucker deal. Oh. He said, I'm the first somebody ever sent a rap record over to the, across the Iron Curtain. That's what they used to call the Soviet Union block there. He introduced that rapper's delight and rest record to the Soviet block and, and broke the record over there. He sold millions of records over there in uh, the Soviet Union. Uh -huh. But the, the Soviet Union and the United States had a Cold War. And their currency was called ruples. Yeah. And the United States did not honor ruples. And they didn't take United States currency. Oh. So it was a circumventing type of management uh, method in order to be able to acquire funds for acquisition of product. Uh -huh. And so what Joe did, he had to get paid. Joe's so smart, he figured out how to get paid. <laughs> Nobody else could get no records over the Soviet Union because they couldn't figure out how to get the money because uh -huh. that was, the currency was, 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 wasn't favorable to each yeah. uh, ideology, which we got, we got a, 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 a what you call a, a, a they got ruples. Yeah. We got American currency. We got capitalism. They got communism. Uh -huh. So with those two clashing ideologies, the currency was frozen. The communication, it was a boycott against one another. So what Joe did, the money that they owed him, the million dollars or so they owed him for the records, he got his money in ruples uh -huh. and went and bought Soviet Lumber, yeah. logs, wood. He bought so a million dollars worth of Soviet wood and sold the Soviet wood to Canada. The Canadian government bought the Soviet lumber and paid for it in Canadian money. He oh. did the Canadian money, transferred it over to American money and went home with the money in the bag. <laughs> Joe tricked the world. That was a genius. So <laughs> Joe, was, Joe Robinson was, was not to be played with. He was smart. 
And he yeah. taught me everything that he wanted me to know. He taught, he used to sit me down and talk to me word by word, situation by situation, so I could understand wow. how to make how the game supposed to go. Nice, nice. So basically, so they like a son. Oh, he loved me closer than the son. Yeah. We listen, me and Joe was 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 cool till he died. Hmm. Yeah. We did a lot of big things, and but see, I had a lot of nerve. I was young and I was desperate, and plus I was Joe's boy. Mm -hmm. I couldn't do no wrong, and I wasn't scared of shit. It didn't make no <laughs> difference. That's not what he really liked, cause you said yeah. he was scared of that. It was a pistol play. That's okay. Come on with that too, cause it was a couple of them. <laughs> It was okay with me. It didn't make me no difference. I'm young, and I, and I've still got to feed this kid. <laughs> the woman to <that> run off. <laughs> I'm back home with my mama and got a baby, and my sister got a baby. I'm trying to take out my mama, my sister, her son, and my son, and myself, and my two brothers. I'm off of struggling in the streets. I gotta do something so no one the option. <laughs> so are you the oldest? Yeah. Wow. Nice. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm the one. Nice. I made sure everybody, I sent my cousins in them to college. I paid for that. Mm. I did everything I could do for everybody that was in my family that I could do something for. And guess what? When it all ended up and all smoke cleared and all was done, everybody said, nobody appreciated nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that the truth? <laughs> <laughs> so what nobody about appreciated nothing? So what about the support and stuff? I know that you know that support that uh your mom was. Uh, take care of your son when you went on the road. But I'm talking about like the support of like ha being happy for you, like people look for now. You know what I'm saying? Did they believe in what you was doing, or did they think that you were just following a dream that was would come to a dead end? Oh, you talking about for in, in Bible with that? Yeah. You no, know, but I've been a go get him. It was since I was a little bitty kid. It was since I was four, five, seven, eight, twelve years old. I've been a go-getter, man. I always wanted to have big things, do big things. I could do big things. I always was a dreamer. Okay, so they already knew what you was gonna do when you got. I was gonna do something. Yeah. If it's wrong, I was gonna do a gang of that too. <laughs> <laughs> it's in the book. <laughs> I ain't trying to cover my color myself. <laughs> Pope or a good guy. <laughs> the book says on the back, it's the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. Now, if you're going to tell the part, say the whole truth, mm -hmm. that word whole truth, oh, that means I got to tell the truth, a lot of the truth. <laughs> and, that, and what I say is nothing but the truth, because sooner or later, somebody going to ask me and challenge me. Exactly. And I got to be able to say <laughs> the right thing. And the right thing is to tell the truth. Exactly. 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 Okay, so tell us about when uh, George Clinton. I know you were saying that uh, he was swift, you know? <laughs> George Clinton, George Clinton was one of the best that ever did it. When you finish talking, if you're gonna keep up with George Clinton, you might as well take your shoes off. The track shoes ain't just too tight. Cause you about to run and catch up with George Clinton. He's been my friends over 50 years. Yeah. Yeah. He's my friend long before he became a big star. Long before he became a big star. Nice. That was my boy. We, we boys, now I did 28 years with that group. Nice. That's P-Funk, that's Parliament. For yeah. long after that, it came about. The group been out 60 years almost. Mm. Parliament for mm. But me and George was friends, we was friends long before they even hit as Parliament. I met him when I signed with a company called Westbound Records in Detroit. And he was over there with, with the Julie Morris and them. And there was Parliament over there with Amma Malady. That's what we've been suing for the last 20 years, trying to get that little $100 million or whatever they owe them from them for the longest. You know, wow. George Clinton was my boy. George Clinton was one of the smartest businessmen in show business as far as records are concerned. But he got it from, you never believe it, I turned him. Wow. 
Ike Turner was truly the absolute smartest guy in record business mm. as an artist. I turned him number one. I've been my friend ever since I was 12. I had the privilege of meeting him in Memphis. Huh? I had the privilege of meeting him in Memphis one time. And uh, they was performing on Bill Street. You hear? I my they, was, they was performing on Bill Street, him and some, the band and some females and stuff. And they called me up on stage to actually be one of the background dancers. <laughs> and I done, I done watched the movie so many times to where I knew the dance moves. So the other females they called up on, they were trying to do what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> let me see, let me see, Ike Turner, Ike Turner, Ike Turner, Ike Turner. I just saw Ike Turner the, the other day in my house. Nice. I don't know where he had. I got a picture of Ike Turner around here in this house. I got all over the place. I got pictures of Ike, but I have one special picture that I had of Ike Turner. Hold on, I'm going to go find <laughs> This is living your dreams with Rosita. I'm loving this. <laughs> the birth of hip hop. Mr. Gene Anderson. Poo Poo Man. The truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Yeah, this is a good book right here. So y'all make sure that y'all go out and read this book. You will learn a lot about how things got started in this industry, the hip hop, the rap, how the rap really got out there. You know, it's so, so much information in this book. And yeah, <laughs> I'm going to read it again. <laughs> yes, yes. The Gene Anderson story. I can't find him. You can't? You I can't find him. He, he on the wall, but I had a special picture of me, and I just saw it last night. Wow. Yeah, that was my boy. I turned it up. I can't find him. Where you at? Look, well, while you up, you can give us a tour then of the pictures. And okay, you can do that. Yes, yes. All right, here you go. That's some of them. That's me and Rick James there. Nice. That's us there. That's me and Rick James. We in jail. Yeah. In jail? Yeah, we with the penitentiary. Me and them both. Slip that in. See the picture back right there? Yeah. That's me and the We sitting there jailing together. That's us again. Nice. You see that? Yeah. That's George Clinton, can you see that? Yes. That's me and Stevie Wonder. Nice. That's me and James Brown. Nice. That's me and Sammy David Jr. Nice. That's me and Lou Rawls. Nice. That's High Records. <laughs> That's Memphis Tennessee, Willie Mitchell and them. That's me and Rick James again. Me and Dick nice. Clark. Raise it up, son. Can you see it? Yes, yes. That's me and Bootsy. Raise it up just a little bit. Like, do you see it? Yes, yes. That's me and George Clinton again. Nice. Wesley Snipes. Raise it. Where, where is it? Raise it up, son. Yes. Uh, that's me and Eddie Griffin, Antonio Fargas, Floyd Mayweather. Raise it up just a little bit. Yes. Nice. All right. That's me and, and, and I turn up and Eddie Griffin. Nice. That's uh Melly Mel and the Furious Five. And me and my boy, that's my boy right there. He's about 12 then. Oh nice. That's the Sugar Hill Gang. Nice. Oh then this is part of the rest of the house. Here's some of my little trophies. And now here, here's my Hall of Fame induction pictures, plaques and stuff, you see? Yes, awesome, congratulations. There's a couple of them. There's a few up there, that's a 
Raise it up. up. Raise it up higher so we can see him. Yes. yes. That's yes. Living, living legend. It's a Hall of Fame inductee again. Nice. Okay, we walk around here. Here's Red Fox and Slap and Wagner. Nice. And here's my gold record for Skate Bounce Rock Roll. You see that? Nice. Yeah, that's me and Red Fox again. Nice. Raise it up just a little bit. Yeah. Nice. All right. Here's, here's a me, this is my favorite picture, me and Duke Ellington. Yes, yes. <laughs> That's me and Snoop, Bootsy, and George Clinton. Snoop Dogg, and Bootsy, and George Clinton. I play as her nose. Nice, nice. That's me and Joe Jackson. That was my man. Yes, nice. Yeah, okay. Here's me and Michael Jackson in the Jackson Five. Nice. Yeah, we rolling along. As I said, this is my uh, certificate for the Las Vegas Museum Hall of Fame. Oh, wow, nice. It's a certificate as an ambassador to the People's Republic of China. Nice. <laughs> and once again, that's Antonio Fargas, Floyd Mayweather, and me with my champagne, the shampoo poo. Nice. <laughs> All right, that's us at the Grammys, the entire PFUG organization. Wow, nice. That's my platinum record I got for the Pointer Sisters. Nice. And this is my display of my book arrangements and awards. And this is my uh, champagne, the shampoo poo in my album. Nice. <laughs> yeah. there's, a, there's a bunch of stuff going on right here. Well, this is, this is my kitchen right here. I cook in it sometimes. OK. Nice. Sometimes I cook in it. It's nice to have a kitchen in the studio. Huh? I said it's nice to have a kitchen in the studio. Yeah, now here we go in the studio. Uh, these are some of the pictures in the studio. This is some of my old albums back in the 70s, 69, nice. 70. Yeah. Here's some photos up here. Nice. Those are some of the guys, Johnny Taylor, uh, uh, Marvin Gaye, Ozzy Osbourne. Tommy Lee, Albert King, Yao McCown, James Brown, Muhammad Ali, Nancy Wilson, Magic Johnson, Snoop Dogg, Roy Ayers. They're around here. Nice. They're around here. Here's some people around here too. That's Steve Poppinum. That's Lou Ross. That's uh, Bubba Knight and Lamont McElmore, the 50 Majors. That's us old time George Clinton P. Funkin back in the way back in the day. Nice. George Clinton did the Duke Ellington again. Me and Eddie Griffin, LL Cool J. Oh. My guitars. Nice. And there's more P. Funk posters and pictures and stuff. Will you, will you, play, something, will you play something on the good time for us? Huh? Will you play something on the good time for us? I don't know nothing about that. <laughs> There's my old uniforms. Whole closet full of my old uniforms in there. Nice. Yeah, we, we fucking them up. This is, this is, I'm gonna take you outside. Okay. Take you outside. Can you see? Mm-hmm. Okay, let me take you outside. Let me see. Okay. Here we go. These are my flowers. I'm trying to make them grow. <laughs> you see, you can't hardly see them. They're dying on me, but the heat is killing them. Mm. But here's my flowers. You see them? They're growing in the ground, little bitty ones. Yeah. I just planted them. Nice. This is my orange tree. It ain't got no oranges, but it's, the, it's staying alive. <laughs> These are my flowers. See, they're trying to grow. Yeah. They're trying their best to grow. Mm. Yep. Yeah, my little barbecue pit. I just barbecued this morning. I had hamburgers, barbecue hamburgers. Nice. Yeah, I'm still out here. Matter of fact, since I'm out here, I might as well stay out here. <laughs> okay, can you see me? Yes, I can see you. I'm still here. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm at home, though. <laughs> this is home. Yes. 
Thank you for sharing all that with us. Oh my God, that is so awesome. <laughs> I am so honored. Yeah, you know what? The lady with a smile and voice like you, I can't do nothing but say, yes, the Queen of Tifa. <laughs> <laughs> so I just told you the best I could. What happened? Some grief. But what you can do, though, yeah. you can tell all of your viewing audiences that they can find my book. Just go to this link, uh -huh. the story.com. The book is called The Birth of Hip Hop. But you just go on the Gene Anderson Story dot com and you can find it on Barnes and Noble and you can find it on a uh Amazon. Uh -huh. But what has happened though, my friend Darius McCrary, the uh -huh. actor that's uh in Family Matters, you remember Darius McCrary? Yeah. Yeah, he's my executive producer. Okay. He is going to be producing. We're in the midst of negotiation right now. His dad turn is in mind. Uh, a documentary on this book. Nice. The Hip Hop. And we're going to shoot a full net motion picture. We already didn't had an agreement. Nice. on Shooting a full net motion picture. They got the money allocated and everything else. They're just trying to get the paperwork proper. Uh, nice. For a full release. On, on the birth of hip hop. So it's gonna be a lot of, we're gonna shoot some in Atlanta, we're gonna shoot some in St. Louis, we're gonna shoot some in Memphis, we're gonna shoot some out here in Hollywood, we're gonna shoot some out here in Las Vegas where I'm at. So you're gonna, you gonna, so you gonna be coming to your town. Is that, so you're gonna shoot this part right here since you said that you turned down CNN, BET, and I, and, 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 and you gonna live your dreams in Rosita, so you get Queen Latifah to play me. Hey, 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 baby, let me tell you something. Anybody forget you had all timers. <laughs> and pretty you is, hey, hey, they can't do the one thing. Her up and try to get you in the pictures. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, this has been a great interview because be truthful. Like I say, I don't like to do too many interviews because I as George Clinton say. Keep the mystique going, Poo Poo. Keep the mystique going. Exactly. Exactly. But you know, this right here, this right here, I, I like I said, I am so honored. I am so honored, you know, that you are doing this on my show, you know, and, and sharing your experience and stuff, you know, the different things and stuff, because people need to hear the story, you know, and, and I can't wait. I can't wait to be in the mood. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's certainly coming. They they yeah. got enough money for me to pay for this little raggedy ass house, so <laughs> I'm gonna take the money and run. <laughs> I'm gonna take the money and run. You ain't running this. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna take the money and run, man. <laughs> I say, yeah. <laughs> Whatever they talked about, I wanna hear it. Come on with it. Just like I told him, if you got any of the money in your pocket right now, can you give me some of it? Just let me know your good faith. A deposit. <laughs> what you saying? I ain't turning down nothing but And I ain't turning that down. I'm pulling it up. It's <laughs> up. <laughs> what you saying? Give you a deposit so they can show good faith. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Whatever you got, just shake them up. <laughs> It ain't got to be all the money, because if you got all the money you're going to pay me in your pocket, it ain't enough, no way. <laughs> Just give me some good faith money and let me know you mean. That's all I mean. Drop it down. Drop it down, big mama. Make it low. <laughs> yeah, you know, one thing for sure. I'm very happy if I could be able to be some inspiration to anybody yeah. for what their designs, their dreams are. Mm -hmm. Because my dreams have been told to me consistently. It's impossible to achieve. And so I never looked at it as a task to be proven because I just looked at it as it's a way of life. Yeah. Life goes up, goes down, goes good, goes bad, goes with it, goes without it. And if you got an ultimatum, if it don't do this, I'm going to have to do that. You are not going to make it in this business. So 
it's an adjustable business. You got to adjust to something else, adjust to something else. And before you know, you look back on what's transpired in your life. And hopefully you got something accomplished that was advantageous to you and somebody else. That's right. You know, I got three things I depend on. First thing I depend on is Jesus. Second thing I depend on is my mother with that my mama gave me, my folks gave me with integrity. The third thing I gave you is don't believe your lying eyes about everything you see. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? All good things, all closed eyes ain't asleep, and all good things don't have to belong to you. Exactly. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. And like, hey, I, I had a lot of influences in life. I had great people mm -hmm. that somewhere through my lifestyle, God gave to me that was very notable, notable people. Like I had that I've been tight with that told me a lot of things that gave me inspiration and insight on being a, 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 a maximum dreamer. And I pray to God to give me more questions. Because oh. with the questions, I'm inquisitive enough to find the answer. Just give me some fresh questions. You know what I'm saying? And I found a lot of people ask me, say, what, what do you tell youngsters that wants to be in show business? That's a frequent question to all entertainers of any notoriety that a person that interview asks them. Uh -huh. And the first thing I tell them is let your parents raise you. The first thing I tell them, let your parents raise you. It's dead kind of people. Uh -huh. Everybody ain't like that, but basically, let your parents raise you. Because they had you and they raised you the best that they want you to be. You get something out of that, get something out of that that makes some kind of decent to you. Uh -huh. Because the first thing is what you, your principles that you have in your life that you get from your upbringing or your environment. That's right. And when you got principles that's decent enough and has value, there's certain things you will not do, no matter what the circumstances will be, consequential or favorable. Mm -hmm. Another thing is that try and get as much education as you can get, because ain't nobody gonna count your money better than you if you ever get lucky enough to get some. And don't never give up. You don't have to give up on your dream to do something else within your dream. That's right. You know, it ain't a do or die thing. It's the way of life. When the bad times come, you depend on the memory of what the good times were and what you could possibly become if this moment does transpire and you go on to something else. Uh -huh. You can't quit. That's right. You know, you can't leave. When you got that, you be here continuously. You know, I've had marvelous people in my life that's been of a value to me, that given me uh, encouragement to, to be beyond what was expected out of me. Uh -huh. Because I know if I came, I ended up with what was expected out of me, a gang of nothing I'd have been. Because they didn't expect nothing to happen decent or crazy that makes some sense with me coming up because I was just, a, I was an innovator. I did things that, that they had never seen before, heard of before, never thought about before, that that was taboo as a black person. Should he be thinking like that, they used to say. Oh. But I never would take that as, as going to be my typical. No. You know, don't mean because you believe it, you got to be right. But you got to believe in something or fall for anything. That's you exactly know? what my daddy said. Well, your daddy didn't lie. You got to snap something or fall for anything. Yeah. And, 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 and you know what? If you never got all that you look for in life, you got more than you deserve. Because when nothing promised to you, you know what I'm saying? Uh -huh. But death. In the end, yeah, it's between the destination. That's the destination. 
but somewhere between it's between the beginning and the destination is the journey. Uh -huh. Let the journey be somewhere within what you desire and require. And if you got any motivation and any respect for yourself, you want something to happen between that journey uh -huh. that makes you last past your life. Uh -huh. My grandpa used to say that your credibility lasts past your life. After you're gone, that spirit has power and weight. But you got to make yourself creditable. Oh. And I always wanted to be somebody. Look at me, look at me, look at me, boy, three, four, five years old. I always wanted to be somebody. I used to, I knew I was talking to, my, I was talking to my son the other day. He's down in Atlanta, too. My older son. I was saying, you know what? He said, he said, Daddy, he said, you ain't never doing nothing else. I said, yeah, I ain't never wanted to do nothing else. <laughs> I ain't never wanted to do nothing else. I, I never had any dreams of doing nothing else but what I end up doing. You know I'd like to have been a better, I hope for the rewards to have been more abundant, but for whatever the rewards were, the rewards was that I was consistently doing what I always felt I yeah. was born to do. Yeah. I, and me too. I, I knew I wanted to be a radio host. I knew I wanted to be a performer. I was the little girl that put on my mama heels and put books on my head yeah. and walk. To I know how to walk. And now I model. I act. Know. I sing. I write movies. I, I, yeah, you I know I As a kid, I'm doing everything I wanted to do. And got more to go. Plenty more, you know what I mean? You got plenty more to do, plenty more to do. Plenty. I ain't not going on out here, girl. I ain't even get in the service yet. You know what? You got to go on. Let me tell you something. I uh, have been in positions where my integrity had more influence than my situation presented. Uh -huh. You know, I've been at the bottom of the pile and still was the best that they had in that area. Um, I've been on what they call the top and I knew that I was the best they had there. Um, I mean, I got the awards of the rewards of those levels, uh -huh. but I got a chance to play. Exactly. Eat. Exactly. And a chance to survive. Uh -huh. You know, one thing I can say, I was with Red Fox for years. And I remember I met Ed McMahon. Ed McMahon had a show called, what was, what was the show was called? Saw Search. Yeah, yeah. And man, he came to our show one day. I was playing at the Hacienda here in Las Vegas showroom. Right? I'm co-starring show with Red Fox. He played there for seven years, right? And I said, Red, I said, tell Ed McMahon to put me on his show, Star Search, right? Yeah. So I could get discovered. Never forget that. Man say, he say, boo boo. You know, I talk to hey, boo boo. Let me tell you something. You don't need to go on no damn Ed McMahon show. You already discovered you with me. That was Red Fox. Man, you don't need to go on no damn Ed McMahon show. You already discovered you with me. No. <laughs> Sometimes you never know. You already might have what you're looking for. <laughs> exactly, right in front of you. <laughs> exactly. Don't even go on the back man show. You already stumbled. You with me? <laughs> Ain't I <I'm> somebody? <laughs> Red Fox. <laughs> uh, I know that was hilarious having him as a friend. I, I know. I mean, listen, the Red Fox is in a long list. Of, of people that I've had, that God has given me the opportunity to befriend, that liked me enough to spend enough time with me, mm -hmm. to really just sock my head up against the wall so I can learn something and know something <laughs> and get something out of their presence. Mm -hmm. You know, I got I got a list of people that you would never believe that in life has had so much influence on me yeah. as a a commodity that was worthy to pass on some of the wisdom and some of the motivation that they gave me, you know? Like- I'm, uh, I'm honored to have you, you know, around me. Oh, you my girl, you all right with me, <laughs> <laughs> Queen Latifah? 
<laughs> Listen, you know what? The first thing, the first time I, the first big, 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 big celebrity I ever met that I recall that had an influence. I met a bunch of them, but from a child on, that was a guy by the name of Noble Sisler. I just graduated from high school. Mm -hmm. I went to Chicago to see a hundred years of Negro progress exhibition. Mm -hmm. And I met this guy named Noble Sisler. And Noble Sisler, he had a partner named Huey Blake. And Huey Blake and Noble Sisler wrote a song called I'm Just Wild About Harris oh. in the 20s. It was in a motion picture with James Cagney. And it was also a rally song for uh, uh, Harris Truman's inauguration. Yeah. And he was, um, he was telling me his life story. And I was, I was young, so I just got out of, I've been out of high school two weeks, just graduated from high school, right? And he was telling me the important, he said, son, you look like you're gonna be one of those that's gonna be in show business all of your life. He said, the only thing I can tell you that you need to know is you need to learn your history about who did what, why they did this, when was it, how they did, why, why we inclined them to do it. Mm -hmm. And how did they sustain it? Mm -hmm. And pass it on to somebody else. And that's the first lesson I got was to find out those facts about entertainment. And now, through the blessings of God, I'm one of them. Uh -huh. You know, that I was told to be aware of. You know what I'm saying? Uh -huh. And I ended up one of them through all of the different adversities in life that I have been involved in in this business. I'm really just now adapting to that. And you passing along. Yeah. Knowledge. You passing along. That should have said volume one. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. exactly. You passing along. That should have said volume one. Yeah. Yeah. So they need to get this book so that y'all can learn some different things that went on. Yeah. And, you know. Go to the, the, the GeneAndersonStory.com. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Your check ain't in the mail, is it? <laughs> That's what I told him news about this document. I said, "Did y'all just give me some of the money today to let me know you mean?" I'm so glad that got a chance to talk with you. Tell Blueprint, I said, "We gonna make great music." That's my boy. Yes. Give him all the accolades that we can get down there with you. He's a good yes. person and smart. Yeah, he really he's is. Smart, very talented. Yes, we're going to cut some great music too. Yes, y'all got some good songs and stuff. I done heard a few of them. This is nice. Oh, yeah, we, we, we hitting them. We hitting them. Yeah. We hitting them. I'm yeah. putting him in. He wants to ride that punk beat. So I got a plan of that. Yeah. yeah I got a plan of that. You say, if you want some of this punk, I've got it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I know we've been on here for a while. I, I really appreciate you. And I want to say once again that I am so honored that you are on the show. Thank you so, so much. And you might have to add this show in segments, part one and part five. <laughs> <laughs> part one through five. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Exactly. I've been saying in real time. I had a wonderful time. I've been on. I've been on. I've been on. But now I'm gone. <laughs> Y'all have been watching Living Your Dreams with Rosita. Thank you so much for tuning in. And remember that no one in that stopped you from following your dreams. Peace and love. Peace and blessings. Peace.